Good morning, Ken. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, welcome to the best of August at Competitive, where we look at the single most interesting tweet of the last 30 days. Uh, let me kick this off, if you, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, over the weekend, Labor Day weekend, my son asked me, hey, Dad, we were doing a video project. It's like, and he was, we were trying to figure out how to transfer that file to my computer. He's like, well, what about, could we store the entire internet on your computer? And I'm like, no, you can't store the entire in internet on your computer. And then we read this article. Uh, this one was in the Wall Street Journal, and it was really popular. It was in Forbes and a lot of other places, originally published in Science. And it was by George Church's lab um, at, uh, MI, excuse me, at Harvard, the Weiss Institute of Biologically Inspired Engineering. Mm -hmm. And what he did was he took a book, not just any book, a book he's about to publish, so very great for his own publicity, and he put that uh, book in in DNA. Yeah. And so, what what was amazing about this? Well, it's a fascinating study, and on a certain level, it's easy to sort of stand back and go, "Well, that's just science for science's sake." But what George Church was doing, or PR for PR's sake, in the mm. case of promoting his book, but what George Church was saying is that we should take inspiration from DNA and be using this extremely dense biological code that carries all the information to recreate a human in, inside a cell um, and use it to store information and store data. Um, and just for some context on this, we did a little bit of research to see, okay, well, just how much data do we have in the world at the moment? Um, world data that's stored digitally was thought to be doubling uh, every uh, three years at the turn of the century. And when you think about all the information that's out there on the internet, you think about um, all the files, all the uh, archival footage and tax records and everything that's being retained digitally, um, that's been doubling every three years. Now it's possibly doubling every two years. So we do have a data crunch and we're looking for places to store it. So George Church is suggesting, well, perhaps we could encode it in DNA and uh, save it for posterity for hundreds of thousands of years before that DNA would potentially break down. There's a lot of remarkable stats um, discussed in these stories. Uh, when you talk about uh, uh, doubling the, the amount of uh, data, um, the uh, head or one of the researchers of this paper actually broke that down. And I learned some new new uh, uh, numbers that I didn't know my that existed. This one is a zettabyte. And he said the internet as of last year was 1.8 zettabytes. Mm. And for context, a zettabyte is a trillion gigabytes. So that's what he could you could store on four grams of DNA. Yeah. Um, the other one was that um, this has been done before, encoding a book. And we would say encoding a book, he had a book that's on HTML, translate to binary. And those zeros and ones became uh, letters in the DNA. A's, mm. A's and C's were like zero, and G's and T's were one. Um, so, and then, and then once it was uh, uh, digitally printed out on a microchip, uh, then you'd have to read it back. And he did that through next generation sequencing machines. Right. Um, they call this kind of um, standard tools now. So, um, this is about 600 times the amount of DNA that was previously encoded. Mm -hmm. So that's a wealth of information, a, a magnitude, uh, order much higher. But here's what was interesting too, is um, he was able to store in that vial uh, where the DNA was 70 billion copies. Right. So there's 70 billion copies of this book right now. Already the most published work in Exactly. Literature. That was George's joke. You can't <laughs> steal that. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's pretty remarkable when you think about it like that, um, just the sheer density of data. But of course, there are practical issues in terms of the effort and technology and resources required to encode it and then to read it. But we all know that in the field of uh, genomics, things are moving very quickly, so this could, uh, you know, could be a viable way forward. His suggestion at the moment is that it will first be useful as archival data storage, not uh, data processing. So really things that um, you just want to have a record of, make sure that it's there and you can always go and retrieve it if you have to, but not necessarily something that you're going to be constantly uh, pulling up and looking at. I mean, when you look at practicality, I mean, uh, this was a, a DARPA grant and DARPA is funded by, the, by us, the taxpayer. Um, and so taxpayers are going to look at this and some are going to be skeptical. As you said, 
uh, what is the practical use of an archive that can store the internet? One question that I would have is the internet without Google, how valuable is it to us? How often do we want to search for information? We need some way to access that information. And this, that hasn't been answered uh, for this, this genomic library. Right, at the moment I think he's just talking about it at a theoretical level and I presume that um, although they use the internet as an example that it was just to try and uh, talk about its potential in, in language that consumers would understand. I imagine that it's got huge applications in any field where you have to record vast quantities of data. Um, George Church mentioned neurology. I'm sure uh, people that are involved in uh, research and astronomy and so on and so forth would uh, would love something that can capture all this data. Uh, then, of course, how they potentially go back and process it's another matter altogether. But one potential thing that we talk about in terms of archiving is increasingly people are going to the cloud to save uh, their vast quantities of data because they can't actually viably store it on their own organisation within their own organisation. So they use the cloud to do that. That's creating some security issues for some people. In fact, I think MSN just lost a whole bunch of Hotmail accounts uh, you know, a few weeks ago. But potentially one way to circumvent those security concerns is uh, to back up the cloud using this DNA coding. I mean, how much stuff on the cloud, as you rightly point out, how much of that stuff do we actually go back and access? Mm -hmm. No, we just like to know it's there. So perhaps you could back up the cloud onto these DNA, uh, which are very stable. Uh, they don't require any cooling or energy to, uh, to maintain, so they're really energy efficient, really green way of storing stuff. And perhaps it would mean that we don't have to build so much more uh, capacity um, going forward. What I like about this, um, and you just alluded to, it is biologically inspired. DNA, uh, you mentioned the density right now, everything is in 2D arrays. This is the first 3D array, because mm -hmm. DNA is, goes in three-dimensional di three conformations. Mm -hmm. And what I like most about this is you might have a Blu-ray disc that's different than um, an HD DVD. Formats change, but the uh, basic building blocks of life they're not going to change. You're always going to be able to read it and write it because that's the basis of life. So um, this whole, it must be an amazing place to work at. It's called the Biologically Inspired uh, in, in, in Engineering Institute. And you know that this guy really cared and was passionate. And I mean this guy meaning George Church, who's mm. well known in the field. He has, um, he made his own sequencer and it has a personal genomics um, program going on to sequence X number of people by this, you know, some year, but he is a leader in his field. And typically leaders in the field don't get out in the lab and do the work. Mm -hmm. If you look at the original paper, he's the first author. So he went back in the lab, kind of a role reversal, and he learned from the guys in the lab, what are the techniques? And he wrote this paper. <laughs> so usually they're the last author, he's the first author, and you can see that passion. And that's, to me, inspiring. This whole going to space or right now the future is here he dreamed of this being able to put um, the internet let's say onto dna and he's made a big leap towards that and there's something to be said for that absolutely he's obviously enthusiastic about it he sees uh, massive potential going forward and you know i think perhaps when you when you talk about the ability to store infinite sums of data for hundreds of thousands of years the mind kind of boggles and perhaps the first reaction as well, what application does that have? But perhaps we're only limited by our imagination. Uh, where this technology could go could be quite remarkable. And I think that's, to me, the take home message of this story. Yeah, and that and the fact that we're all actually uh, walking works of literature. Yes, that's true. <laughs> um, so, you can keep your book closed. <laughs> I, I will, uh, um, I'll read it at some other point. But thank you, uh, everyone. Please uh, stay tuned for next month's uh, best of, uh, at, I guess it be September uh, All right. at Competitive. Feel free to email us, twitter at competitive.com, or tweet us at Competitive. Thanks a lot, Eamon. Thank you, Ken. Catch you later. You too.